<laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I perfect. actually made the bed today. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's why I have my background just straight to the wall, so I don't have to be too worried about those things. Smart, very smart. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. Welcome Kelly and start by making a land acknowledgement. Uh, we want to acknowledge that we're in the province of Alberta. We're situated on traditional territories of treaties 4, 6, 7, 8 and 10. And ancestral homeland of diverse First Nations groups, Métis and Indigenous people whose ancestors have walked this land since time immemorial and whose histories, languages and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. We pay respect to Indigenous people of this land, past, present and future, while recognising their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship to the land on which we reside. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and for signing up for attending this training session, which is part of the Digital Economy Programme. It's a partnership between Business Link and Digital Main Street and funded by the Government of Alberta. Um, this is the third in a series of 12 workshops um, that are going to really guide you through the steps that you should be at least thinking about to getting your business more present and more successful online. Um, in addition to these workshops, there's two other ways that the Digital Economy Programme can support you and your business. Uh, firstly, we have the shop here powered by Google Stream of the Programme. So if you're a brewery in Brooks or a coffee shop in Calgary um, and you are looking to get your products online um, and, and add an e-commerce element to your business, the shop here powered by Google program can help you, can support you with that. Um, you can find out more at dep.businesslink.ca, the website for the program. And then launching in the new year, there's the other part of the program, which is the digital service squads. Now, these are going to be groups of trained squads in um, different parts of the province, and the whole province will be covered, where they can come into your business and work one-to-one -one with you on to to have your business more online. So that's going to be a great opportunity starting in the new year. And again, you can pre-register for that at dep.businesslink.ca. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to yeah, re-welcome Kelly and her beautifully uh, curated office there. Um, and, uh, and so we welcome her to talk about um, identifying our audience um, and really you know, focusing on that today. I'll uh, put it over to Kelly. Thank you so much, Matt. And hello, everyone. It's so nice to be with you and to know that we're reaching people outside of Alberta. That's exciting as well. It's there's entrepreneurs everywhere. I heard a stat on the radio um, <clears throat> this morning, my AM radio, because that's, I guess, how old and not digital I am sometimes. Uh, but just talking about how there's actually been a reduction in the amount of self-employed individuals across our country. And it surprised me because we're also hearing the flip side confusingly about how, how so many more people are becoming, you know, self-employed and solopreneurs and, and diving into new business. And the concern on the latest stat was that it is small business owners and entrepreneurs who are the innovators of our nation. And they, they not only create, you know, inventive ideas and bring them to life, but they're also, you know, key in creating competition and just, you know, putting Canada and Alberta on a global stage. So, I uh, think we could all probably agree that uh, small business ownership and entrepreneurship and innovation is alive and well. It doesn't matter the size of your business. We are talking about all things forward thinking, crystal balling our audiences a little bit today because we know how important that is now, six months from now, six years from now to know who they are, how that's changed. And just on the whole, everything uh, to do with becoming more digitally savvy, selling online, promoting yourself online, growing your reach, reaching new audiences, no matter what your borders or your, your locality is. And so, yeah, so glad you're here and I'm thrilled to be hosting. Perfect. Thanks, Kelly. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. If you just give me one moment here to uh, set it up in a way that's going to be a portion of my messy screen, which is a lot less curated as Matt says than my office. Um, and with this too, as usual, we have a workbook for you. So I think uh, if it's Rebecca who's managing the chat from Business Link can let yeah. you all know how that's going to be made available. 
I'll be referencing it throughout. This time we have two key activities in our workbook. Um, none of these are mandatory, but you know we, we pride ourselves on having actionable learns, not just talking at you, but really hoping that you leave these workshops and this series as a whole with items that are implementable, immediately you know, put into play, if you will, whether that's your brand values that have been revamped or your bio statements like we talked about two weeks ago, or hopefully today, some really key audience ideas or audience targeting ideas to go forward with. Uh, Matt, anything you want to add there about course materials? Um, not really, just more housekeeping for the for, for this hour. It is an information, or the last two have been an information packed hour, but we've also had lots and lots of questions. For questions, there is a Q&A tab in Zoom. So could you, just so I don't miss any um, and can make sure they're all addressed, could you use the Q&A tab if you have a question? If you have a comment or want to add anything to the discussion, I'll keep half an eye on the chat um, as well. Uh, but definitely if you've got a, a question, add it in there. Thanks, Kelly. Awesome. Okay. So uh, over here at Social School, we're based in Calgary, but we uh, have been so honored to work with entrepreneurs and small businesses for over a decade now, really helping you become more digitally savvy. That's our mission. Um, and again, it's such an honor to be here helping you all do that at this very key pivotal time in our <laughs> province's history and, and uh, you know, global uh, reality. So what we're going to talk about today is building on the things that we did in uh, weeks one and two, or workshops one and two, I should say, where, you know, we established more uh, succinctly, hopefully, we defined more clearly our brand, our values, our purpose. Why? Not because we want to get all woo-woo and, you know, go really emotionally uh, charged on our businesses, but because it's what matters to people today. You and I, if we take off our marketing hat and we put on our general consumer hat, we are drawn to the businesses and the people and the, the organizations that are real and honest and open and transparent. And sure, maybe you're just getting your tires changed, but you want to feel like you know and trust the person you're working with more than ever before. It doesn't matter what vertical industry you know, um, job you're talking about. So we're building on that today and we're really defining those people. Who are they? What do they need from us? And remember, building on, on workshops one and two, what's the problem they need us to solve for them? How do we make it so much about them and their problem, issue, concern, online query, not about us and how great we are and how accomplished or studied or, you know, um, well-versed we are in something. It's about reading our people, knowing their needs, meeting them where they are, platform by platform, but also connection by connection, and then solving those problems. We've talked a lot about it, but today it's all about targeting those people properly. So few, uh, I've got two sections here for you. First, we're gonna talk about targeting in general. And then the second half of the workshop, we're going to talk about digital audiences because it's all fine and good to you know, map out some audiences on paper. But when we take that to a digital platform, particularly like Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, we can actually target our content. So our posts, our paid advertisements, of course, and there has never been more powerful tools to do this. I would never wanna tell you to not support local media and buy radio ads or put something on a billboard if you feel so inclined but the power of digital advertising and boosted or promoted content targeting today is unbelievable. And you know this because you're being followed around on the internet and those Ugg boots you put in your checkout for your 13 year old daughter just keep coming back to haunt you until you buy them. There is unbelievable opportunities here to do this in a really a natural way too. Don't, uh, we're not gonna talk about anything that doesn't feel really um, good and isn't something that small businesses can employ just like the big guys do. So first of all, the fundamentals of audience targeting. We know, I don't have to tell you, that the struggle to be seen and heard has never been more real. We talked about, you know, entering the market and how there's so few barriers to entry because of domain purchasing and website building at anyone's fingertips. Launching an Etsy shop, launching an Instagram shop, you can do it quite easily today in a matter of hours. So we've got to know where our market is and we've got to go where they are. And then of course, when we get there, we better be reaching them in a way that's personalized, that's targeted to them. The girl on top 
probably wants content and promotional messaging and products that are a whole lot different, if I generalize and you're okay with that, than the guy on the bottom. Very different lifestyles, very different needs, very different expectations of the brands they're engaging with. I love this because I'm such a marketing nerd, but if we think about the way that things have evolved, and I'm gonna point out some of the things that we've, we don't even realize um, in our expectations as audience members. Back a decade ago, you know, it was this unbelievable thing that we could create content on the internet in email marketing, in blogs, in podcasts, web, uh, webinars, and social media content. And we could serve it to the right people. Holy smokes, I'm targeting women who have dogs. And then we started to be able to serve it at the right time, just being more able to access data insights to see when our people are online. When are they opening that e-newsletter? When are they reading our blog? Oh my goodness, let's, let's get a little more strategic. Days of the week, times of the year. Then we were able to start serving it to them for the right reason. Well, because we have a holiday sale and this group of people loves our promotional sales, but this group of people wants our resources. So we're getting a little bit segmented. And then we were able to serve it where we are now, the right content to the right people at the right time for the right reason. So all of these things kind of come together and the right content is key there. You're not going to be serving up content successfully to the guy who's looking for car parts if you're also sending him women's hosiery notifications from hudsonsbay.com. He wants what he wants. And you and I as audience members and consumers have so little patience and such high expectations because that's who we are, that if your algorithm's not reading you right on Spotify or Netflix suggestions are bad or those e-newsletters are not on point, you're out. Unsubscribe, unfollow, spam, turn away, turn off, turn down. So it's a bit of a tall order, but it doesn't have to be too confusing. Most of us could make small changes to our segmenting and just kind of targeting our audience understanding and do really well. We're just not thinking about it very much before we start puking out content onto the internet. So again, back to that idea of knowing our people deeper than just women who like dogs. Well, what are their fears, desires, dreams? This is also how we can cut through the noise of all the other stuff and start to actually create meaningful content that stands out. And they understand who we are and why they should choose us and our car parts over the other persons because they actually feel like we, they can trust us, they know us. So in order to do that, we have to first understand them, their hopes, dreams, fears, and frustrations as we started to touch on a couple weeks ago and as it relates to what we're selling versus those surface level assumptions. If you remember, we talked about iceberg emotions. Well, here's what I'm looking for, but here's what I'm really hoping you'll do for me and make a difference in my life. This is where we go deeper. Uh, I use the example of Janine, the, the hypothetical character that I created out of a real woman I knew 10 years ago who needed online PR training. And she was the person that I built out as an avatar or a customer profile, which we're going to get to in a few minutes, that I really started to pretend I knew her way better than I did, but I knew enough. And I built out all the other pieces of where she would travel if she could and the magazine she reads and who she hangs out with and her political beliefs and her religion and her age and her, because then I felt like I could talk to her like a friend. I could talk to her really, really clearly. Tim Ferriss, as I mentioned, famously said that he built the four hour work week, not because he, that book that has now become a, a famous bestseller, not because people thought it was a good idea, but because he knew his four best friends wanted it. And he spoke to them when he was building the product and the, um, the uh, actual piece of the content that he was speaking to them with. So when we have demographic, psychographic and behavioral segmentation happening, we are going beyond those surface level elements and we're going deeper into the emotional triggers for people. And we've talked about this a little bit, but we're gonna build on this. So what are some of these pillars? Well, geographic and demographic are pretty basic surface level stuff. So when we think about city and country and region, yes, goes without saying that you're targeting people in a certain area and that's not that hard to do. Maybe harder with your e-newsletter, but if we're talking about social content or ad campaigns, bingo. The first thing you do is target people that live in Southern Alberta or Brooks, Alberta. 
From there, of course, we can have those demographic factors play in that, yeah, definitely, you know, age, gender, um, income, perhaps some of those life stages or occupations, not hard as well. This is for my married audience. This is for my about to be married. Or I, uh, a couple of girlfriends that run a counseling uh, business in Calgary, I might have mentioned, that have um, your pre-divorce, your mid-divorce, and your post-divorce. And this is the business they run, but they have three very clear audiences. Those groups don't really overlap for them. For some of you, your audiences will, and that's perfectly fine. If you can't build one avatar, no problem. You have permission to build more than one and, and then grow from there. The psychographic and behavioral things are where if you can go there and you can find a little bit of some deeper content or deeper fears and frustrations for, for your audience members, uh, amazing. Again, we can connect deeper. And the behavioral stuff doesn't really come into play unless you have some data at your fingertips. So you have a pixel on your website that is, um, or on that you've built in Facebook, for example, and it's installed on your website and it's tracking people who were on your website last week but didn't make it to your checkout page and now you're retargeting them with some facebook content so this is where we can start to see those behavioral things come into play maybe you have an e-newsletter service that's sophisticated enough that you send the e-newsletter and for the people that don't open it behavior they get it again and the people that do open it get something else so we can start to, with our platforms and tools of today, start to look at behavioral uh, things. So it doesn't have to be that complicated, but it is available to you if you want to go there. And we just had a question in the chat really about how, sure. do we, and it's a technical question probably, but how do we segment our mailing list or Instagram or Facebook? Do we just post different content at different times in different groups? Like how to practically, I know you mentioned some of the things and, and some of these things we're going to have to pay for, aren't we? I'm assuming. Yeah, you're right. Some of these things pay for, sure. If we're talking about paid ad content targeting, that's a bit of a no-brainer, but you know, we'll, we'll get there. In fact, in workshop number nine, when we go into paid content, we're going to build on all of this, uh, but that's not until March. Um, but there's plenty of things we can do with our e-newsletter list to start, Matt, and that is such a great Found it. But if you can go in and revisit your mailing list, if you have one, or if you're building one, start out with some kind of, um, and every provider does this, whether it's MailChimp, Constant Contact, Emma, you can now build a form that's not just name and email address, but maybe a little radio button. Are you interested in culture, food, or fashion? Great. Or are you in Alberta, BC, Manitoba, or Saskatchewan? Well, now we have some form of segmentation, but you've got to map that out first in order to understand what people want. And the tools and that's are a, there. This is link in a very simple way for our newsletter. I know that we, we ask for their town. You know, we ask for which municipality in Alberta are you? And just, it helps us be able to serve up content that is matched to their particular need is pointless as Sunday to people in Grand Prairie if we're running an event in Calgary and um, so That's it just awesome. allows yeah. that uh, just yeah. on, on this question as well uh, and I'm sure you'll have an answer here what when it comes to b2b we're you know we're talking about people we're talking about end consumers what about business Clients. Great question. Yeah, I think another thing for us to think about, and this would fall more into, um, you know, psychographic or behavioral factors, if you're going to segment, but where are they at in their buyer journey? So have they purchased from you before? Or let's start earlier. Are they a cold lead? We're going to get to this in the second half of the workshop. They don't know who you are at all. And you're reaching them with some brand new stuff. It's that, hey, I'm alive, top of funnel messaging we talk about and we'll get there where it's um talking to strangers big broad messaging and then hoping that you get them in your fold they've subscribed to your e-newsletter they started following your facebook page well now you can speak to them a little differently because they're a warm audience they've heard of you maybe they've bought from you before maybe a long time ago or maybe they just once one time saw a facebook post from you but you can actually now start to bring them further through that journey, get them closer to buying. And that's the goal. This is customer journey 101. So I think if we are a B2B company and we're not targeting on region or gender or age or interests, 
then that buyer stage is a really important thing for us to think about. And that can happen pretty easily too. You don't even have to segment in that regard. You can just welcome them into your e-newsletter. They find you on, on the internet because you're running ads or you know running an Instagram campaign or something or content. And then they land on your site, they subscribe. Well, now they're already into a second audience, which is that warm group. Awesome. And you nurture them along. Yeah. And we do have an, an email marketing um, workshop coming up too in the new year, which is a really important one. I constantly mention email marketing as we're talking about social media and all of this foundational stuff because it is such a powerful communication tool. And consumers statistically like it best because we all have the power to unsubscribe at any time, open and read it when we want to versus being interrupted in our social media scrolling. So we'll get there. And that's another place where we, we're really going to be talking more about segmentation and, and audience targeting. Perfect. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Thank you, Matt. So when we talk about this customer persona building, and this is growing on, you know, those, those segmentation factors, just start thinking about what factors of segmentation you might be able to employ in your content or your digital marketing efforts on a whole, if you're also say blogging or doing email marketing. So again, we go back to that question of who are they, but who are they really? And defining the factors that you're able to. From there, we're going to build out some personas. And again, you can start with one or you can have a few. I've worked with company that, companies that just are getting started and they have 10 personas. And that's great that like Jason wants this and Todd wants that and Peter really loves this and here's his desires and fears. But in the end, you have to ask yourself, if you were to sit down and write content tomorrow for Peter versus Jason versus Todd or Sheila, is it all that different? And that's where in some cases we want to pare it down. The fewer people you're speaking to authentically, the better. And as I said, two weeks ago, you'll catch a whole lot more people if you do it really well to that one individual, because other people feel it. We feel magnetized to this voice that's very real. And it doesn't matter what demographic we fall into. We're going to be attracted probably to what you're saying. Um, so from there, some segmented lists. So it's almost your turn to, uh, to give this a crack. Um, thinking about, and you're going to have a workbook to do this with. Um, maybe Matt can let us know. I can also post it in the chat if needed, because we have some exercises for you. Sure Thank you. Is, yeah. So ideally here, three simple exercises. And actually, the third one you've already done, but I popped it in here as a bonus because um, I just want you to go back and revisit this if needed from two weeks ago's workshop. It was exercise one where we're thinking again about what is our offer and how does it serve people? And that's step one. You've really got to know that. But today, how can we really know our customer and show that we know them and, and sum them up with some of these demographics and geographical things we're talking about and then even some of those deeper things? So your pain points again, how you can help solve them, what do they desperately desire or want to feel? And then if you can map out a fictional persona. So do you wanna name that person if you want? And this can be a real person. I've also built audiences literally for myself with myself 10 years ago as the customer and I knew her quite well. Um, so who are you serving and how can you really define them? And almost stick a photo on there. And if you want to have three of them for different life stages, different customer journey stages, or just your BC prospect, your Alberta prospect, and your Saskatchewan prospect, for example, totally up to you. And then if given the chance, which you all are hopefully have, if your social feeds are ready to go, or some of your content building up efforts are underway, what would you say to them if you're face to face tomorrow? And how do you know for sure that you understand them well enough to reach them with method messages that solve their problems and not yours, right? And of course, we don't like to be sold to. So this is pretty important stuff. We want to feel like this person knows us, they get us, and they're showing up at just the right time with just the right thing. Any thoughts there, Matt, before we dive uh, into audience types? We just had a quick question, which I can answer in part, uh, but I'd be interested to get your view as well. Just someone wanting to know where online do you research your target market um, if you are at the very beginning of starting your online business? So you don't have the data, you don't know who's done business with you so far. That's a great question. And it's not an easy one to answer. I always think about it as you've got your data insights and your anecdotal insights. And 
a lot of companies, marketing companies in particular and platforms will have us believe that we have to just live and die by the data. And that would not only be your Facebook insights and your Instagram results and your LinkedIn insights. And that's showing us, you know, what kind of content performs well, who's engaging with it, when they're engaging. And then if we shift over to the bigger picture, our Google analytics showing us how our website's performing, we can see behaviors. What do people do when they get to our website? How long do they stick around? What pages do they visit? Where are they coming from? So again, what content or marketing channels are working for us to show we get there? And then so much more on who those people are and age and interests and affinities and all this stuff. But what if we just put all that aside, especially if we don't have reliable info there yet, and we anecdotally know who these people are? I'm a big fan of asking questions on, you know, to your market in a survey or on the Facebook feed or whatever it is to say, hey, what do you think of this tagline for my new t-shirt or our new uh, wine of the year or whatever? Sure, you can ask for feedback, but I honestly find most often that anyone in business who's worth their chops and knows why they're in the business they're in can describe that person and those needs pretty easily. And if you can't, maybe it's time to kind of take another look and, and uh, open the doors a little bit to understand and get to know them a bit better. But this is one of those exercises, just like cleaning your list and segmenting people almost individually and tagging them with the province they live in. If you haven't done that yet, you've got to do some homework here. The grandma test I introduced a couple of weeks ago, like does your grandma or someone in your life understand what you're selling clearly and on first glance of your website? And likewise, do you know your audience well enough to be able to describe them? And I think it's super important to back up a few steps and find out one way or another, whether it's data or anecdotal you know, feedback, uh, if you haven't done so. Yeah, uh, that would be absolutely a right point is to definitely go back, you know, like, like presumably you're starting this business because you have a passion for it. You understand, you think you understand the market or you have a hunch, you know, like I can make something here. Like I was yeah. in my neighborhood the other day and I was like, we really need a kind of modern coffee shop that's not a Starbucks. Like I had a hunch there, you know? And so yeah. like, and, and then I go, well, who is my likely market for this coffee shop? And where do they hang out? You know, like you've got to kind of do that journey. And I mean, it's so different for online. You know, like if I decided, I think there's a gap in the fishing equipment market online. Well, the, there's a starting point there where people, we sometimes at Business Link run into situations where people are, you know, passionate about the idea of starting a business, but they don't quite know what that business is yet, you know? And, yeah. and that is, that's that kind of early stage, that exploratory work. And just to plug yeah. Business Link, we can definitely help you in that area, yeah. you know, and getting you to look at perhaps trends that are out there or things, your own passions, your own strengths and getting you to think from that point of view. But yeah, I always think it has to start from a hunch, doesn't it? Like, a, I think this is my market and then we can go and do the research um, from that. Thanks Absolutely. so much. Do you have another um, quick question here if we have time for sure. it? Yeah. How do you think about getting reliably feedback on brand new product to create your personas using companies like Sampler? I don't know if you're familiar oh. with Sampler. I don't know Sampler. I know there's a few out there that can be that kind of crowdsourced info or again, um, you know, hosting or uh, facilitating forums, surveys. Um, what's the word I'm looking for where they put a whole bunch of people in a room behind a black screen or a, a darkened window? Pardon? Like focus, like focus, focus groups. groups. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and of course now there's digital versions of that. If that's what um, what that service does, I would assume that it's probably worth its weight if it's in the right market. If you're getting the kind of data from the people that you know will potentially be your audience, um, and uh, at the same time. I firmly believe that you can't just lean on that. Like we have to know and hear and see firsthand that people want what we're offering. And, and it's not enough as we all know to just build it and expect they will come. We've got to have um, you know, proof almost that this is a viable product. And there's so many in this tech and the startup words, world, you know, um, minimum viable product or, or just like quick to launch, like any kind of 
tactic you want to employ that gives you that immediate feedback is really good. I would say that from a marketing perspective, put out content, see what's working, get it going. Don't sit on this for a year and overthink it, over strategize it, see what people are resonating with. And the same thing, of course, applies. I'm no business development or product launch expert. However, um, the feedback you're going to get from those focus groups or small launches, beta launches is imperative. And that's going to give you more than any kind of data insights online, or in my opinion, a survey company ever could. So yeah, seeing how it's really um, yeah, analysis paralysis, as Susan, Susan says, absolutely. Uh, Barbara, I mean, you kind of addressed it there almost. Barbara asked the questions, do we ever get to the point where you know your audience or your customers so well that marketing becomes intuitive and less methodical I mean I got an opinion that absolutely like that happens and it should happen um yeah interesting no I agree I mean I I I don't want to you know say that I've got some crystal ball but for us in business at social school we've been providing and 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 we've had the benefit of being able being able to build products and launch products quicker than our competitors who are oftentimes higher educational institutions that take forever to launch a TikTok course they just don't have it in them they're a cruise ship that's trying to turn and we're a little sailboat so we have that benefit, but then the flip side of that is that we oftentimes listen to what sounds like 50% of our audience and it's like 2%. So we're racing to please that 2% versus servicing the 99 who are actually wanting more of what we already have or the cold audience out there that doesn't yet know what we have. So this is where we have to be so careful, especially as shiny ball entrepreneurs who want to keep pivoting and building and launching and instead of focusing sometimes on what's really working and what we know to be needed. That's again, I think business 101 and knowing yourself and knowing your audience really well, yes. But in this age of constant pivots, um, and, and I think the startup community can certainly attest to this, uh, you've got to be really aware of who you're serving before you start building and then having to pivot again. I see this a lot with our clients. Just this morning, I emailed a gal who has a big tech startup with a big amount of investors behind it. And the product has completely evolved from a year ago. And I know she's excited about it because they're, they were garnering feedback and that's the natural evolution or iteration, as they would say, in startup land. Um, but we want to try and avoid the, those wasted times and efforts too. So Again, knowing your people in whatever way it takes to garner that information before you start promoting, marketing, advertising, and even launching is so, so important. Perfect. Thanks, Kelly. I have a, a really, really quick anecdote. I was working with a business down in the Pincher Creek area. They did reclaimed building materials. You know, they would pull things out of a building and then they, they sell them. And so she had a big yard and she and people used to come down from Calgary and various places to come shop there. She said to me, the business owner, that when people pulled up in their car and, and got out of their vehicle, she could tell by the vehicle that they were driving and the clothes that they were wearing whether they were going to be customers. Just because <laughs> she just knew who, the, who her people were. Um, and I think we probably, yeah, we get to that stage, hey? Yes, that is incredible. Oh, <laughs> yeah, my gosh. It's an interesting thing, yeah, for sure. That is really cool. Excellent. Okay. So everyone, we've got, um, you know, some ideas, hopefully. And if you can work on that persona building, that's great. I'm going to repeat one more time that you don't just have to have one audience. That's a common question that we see. I, I haven't read everything in the chat to ask, see if that question has been asked, but you know, people that panic when told you've got to just have one persona. And I will clarify or restate that it is important to know one key persona to start at least so that you can speak really authentically to that person. And I'm talking from a marketing standpoint, content and marketing, promotional materials, and that authenticity that comes across when you're having a one-to-one -one conversation and the ability to close a sale is the second part of that versus speaking to everyone. That is literally paralysis for a lot of people too. Oh my God, I'm posting to 1400 people right now. How do I even begin? No, no, go back a step. Post it to me, Charmaine, who loves wine and tell me why this is for me, right? So from there, if you want, feel free to build out several other personas and talk to those people too. But I caution you to do too many because if you do your job with that one and you know who it's for, again, you're going to capture a lot of other people that are similar or drawn to that message, whether you knew they would be or not. Okay, so 
audience types in a sort of more digital landscape is important for us to think about as well, because of course what we're doing here is not just building audiences to write in our diary and think about them. We are writing or crafting these so that we can better reach them online in our digital platforms and our marketing efforts. So before we go ahead and do any kind of content, uh, and certainly any kind of digital advertising or, or traditional advertising, we need to build awesome audiences that translate into the digital space. And a way we do this is further to what we were chatting about 10 minutes ago with B2B in particular, where maybe I don't have demographic factors or that's not really working for me. What if I talk about it in a way of, or I think about my audiences as where they are in their buyer stage, their customer journey? Do they even know who we are yet? Have they heard of us? Or have they heard of us 10 years ago, but we need to reintroduce ourselves? Where do they stand? Is this a new product for them? Is it something they're desperate for or something that like Camp Hoo-Ha, the example I gave a couple weeks ago, I didn't even know how bad I wanted brownie camp for ladies until it was staring me in the face. And I was like, holy smokes, hallelujah moment, weight off my shoulders or joy or elation or fun or whatever that feeling is that I didn't even know I needed. So we're thinking about the customer journey actually as the foundation of our audience building. This is part of the, you know, well, the most important underlying factor here. And it does tie in to all of those geographic, demographic, et cetera, factors. So when we think about the customer journey, AKA ADA, maybe you've heard of this, it's an age old term. And ADA can apply to sales, marketing, search engine optimization, it doesn't really matter but we're thinking about it as it relates to our audiences and their stage in the buyer journey. So that's top of funnel down to the bottom of funnel. And a funnel, whether you're talking a sales funnel, marketing funnel, is not the prettiest way to see real life humans and where they sit in the funnel. Sometimes we turn it sideways and talk about it as the customer journey, but either way, when you are in the top of funnel of anything, you are in the awareness building stage and you are, for the realtor example, dumping new leads into that funnel all the time. I say realtors because we hear this anecdote a lot that a realtor needs to make a thousand outreach efforts in order to get a hundred connections in order to get 10 phone calls and one client. I mean, pretty broad term there or uh, an analogy, but the idea is that we move them down into the interested stage and then that desire stage, and then they take action. And of course, some people move through this funnel or journey very quickly and others take years. I gave you the example of my weird Honda Pilot buying exercise where I saw the right content at the right time for the right reason when I was searching for interior size of a Toyota 4Runner versus a Highlander and I bought a, Toy a Honda Pilot because where it was and it just made sense. I took action quickly. We're not all suckers like that. Some people take a long time, but we have to know where people are at in their journey and nurture and move them along accordingly. Again, I'll repeat that one of the most offensive things today is the telemarketer who got your phone number and hasn't nurtured you. You didn't opt in. You have no idea where they found you and how dare they reach you at the action stage where they want you to buy. You're like, what is this? You didn't even read my algorithm properly. So as it relates to our, say, ads or content or anything that we're doing in, you know, our audience building efforts, we think about it as that new leads, warm leads, and hot leads. And this is where, you know, we spend a little bit more at the top because we have to target in a more of a spray and pray approach. We have to reach people as if we're a billboard on the side of the highway. I know that I'm targeting people in medicine hat. And that probably, you know, I have to target 10,000 people, a massive portion of the city, because I don't know yet how or who of the 2,000 buyers that I might be able to attract, um, I haven't yet identified who they are. So we're going to sort of nurture people along and ideally spend a little less as we go. And when we get down to the bottom of that funnel, we have an audience that's ready to take action. Our language changes a little bit. We are you know, able to reach them with exactly the message that they're hoping for. It's that e-newsletter with the coupon. That's gonna put them over the edge. Or it's the scarcity, you know, time constrained um, uh, Facebook ad that's gonna get them to finally buy that ticket to that event because now's the time. I've told you about it, I've told you about it, and now it's time. So we're basically thinking of this in terms of 
an additional piece of our audience building. And if this is too much for you or you're not quite ready to go there, no problem. I'm calling these optional exercises. And we're not going into Facebook Business Manager or any kind of audience builder online just yet. We will be going there in March in our, in our, when we start talking about social selling and paid ads and some of that promoted or boosted content done a little bit better than maybe you've been doing to date. Classically, especially small business owners or people that are just kind of doing what they can online with lot, wearing lots of hats, they start boosting their content without properly building their audiences. And so if we can parlay this, this stuff that we did off the hop here of really thinking of who these people are and then building these out or turning these into sort of more digital friendly audiences, that is awesome. So you're going to have that opportunity in your workbook, mapping out still just on paper, a cold top of funnel audience or audiences if you want. Then what do the warm people look like? Well, where are they at? What do they need to hear from you? What would be the message you might deliver? And then what do those hot audiences look like? So we're still pretty broad here, you guys. This is still just exercises in brainstorming, identification. The question asked earlier about how are you thinking about you know, getting the information you need? Is it from your data insights? Is it anecdotally feedback, surveys, whatever? This is all part of the process, but you've got the opportunity to map out or further define your cold, warm, and hot audiences, if that makes sense to you. Sound okay? Sounds good to me. Okay. Uh, I've just got one question, and uh, sure. I, can, I can definitely start to answer it. Um, how long does it take to go through the ADA or IDA, AIDA process? Is this one year to transition from top to bottom of the funnel or, uh, or different? It really depends on the audience member. And I'm not even going to say it depends on how big the product you're selling is. But normally we would think about it as like, listen, if you're needing a turkey dinner and you have to go to the grocery store, you might be served up a piece of content from Sobeys on Monday morning and literally be taking action on that turkey dinner and cranberry special that they have by Tuesday afternoon. That's a very fast journey and a fast funnel and the messaging worked but you're probably already a warm or hot buyer, an existing customer. You know Sobeys. It's not like someone called like Soho's and you're like, who's this? Do they actually sell good turkeys? I have no idea. So if I'm not familiar with this other brand, a new company that's suddenly appearing in my newsfeed or being recommended to me by a friend or showing up in Google search, I may take longer. So where are they at in their customer journey with you in terms of familiarity and trust? And then also, how big is the product that you're selling? Is it a car? You're probably going to take a few months, unlike me. If it is something, it's a Christmas present. It just, it again, goes back to the needs, desires, and sort of level of urgency for your buyer. And, the and that's size so of that true. So yeah, it, there are, because I, I would, my instant reaction was, yeah, the larger the product, like if it's a home renovation or it's probably going to be a very, very long process. And I'm going to speak to various things, get numerous quotes, things like that. But actually, if I think about my mother-in-law in that situation, she would just decide who it was she wanted. She would, her friend would say to her, this is a good guy. And she would go with it. Like, and, and that's a, you know, and that's a 20 minute process for her. Totally. Um, and yeah. so, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is interesting. Like, And the car example, exactly the same, isn't it? Some people, they just want it done. They want to go yeah. into the showroom. They know who they're going to go with and it's done. Someone yeah. else, it's months pouring over websites. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, on a broad perspective there, that is why, uh, like everything we're talking about in this entire workshop shop series is about building our online footprint. The problem for us as owners and marketers, you don't know where they're going to find you in the journey. I might just have that recommend for that renovation company and buy tomorrow. I'm at the end of my journey. I'm ready to take action. I don't need to be nurtured, advertised to, followed up with, just give me the quote. I'm ready to go because my friend told me so. Sorry that you spent $50,000 of ads in my neighboring city. Didn't work on me. I just needed to be told. So we don't know always where people come from or how we're going to reach them. We just want to know that we've laid the groundwork that when they find us, they can find some positive reviews. They see we have a LinkedIn page. We write articles. They immediately build trust with us and rapport for whatever they have you know, seen or heard of us to date or not. And we can effectively move them along and hopefully get them to choose us as customers.
Awesome. There are so many good comments. I might just save them to the end, just so we have time to cover the content because we're kind of at 11.46. Okay, awesome. <laughs> um, I'm going to finish with a few final slides here, you guys. So, And just because I want you to start thinking about how you might implement these audiences online, because I think a natural follow-up question is, okay, I've got my audiences, what do I do with them now? Um, and of course, in two weeks, I'm really excited about, um, I'll just flash to the last slide here, workshop number four, story and content. So we're going to talk about how to attract and grow the audience with our content. But again, I'll just tee up that, you know, down the road as we get more further along in these workshops and more sophisticated, we're going to talk about targeting with paid ads and paid content. We'd be remiss if we went there before we talked about the right kind of content to target them with. But just a quick note on how it's done on Facebook and Instagram and then LinkedIn and TikTok and YouTube have all played copycat because Facebook built such a powerful audience building tool. So um, if you're ready to go there and look into some of these things, you're going to take your beautiful audiences that you've built in your cold top of funnel um, kind of map and you would create saved audiences. These again are built on interests, behaviors, demographics, and they're, they're often endlessly, um, they have endless potential because of how many different elements we're able to pull into them um, and a necessary starting point. Audience type number two is warm. So as I mentioned earlier, this is what, you know, we, we would call our middle of funnel. Um, a bit more definition for you here on that. And then in Facebook, it would be called a lookalike audience. So if I flash to the third audience, a hot, which Facebook calls a custom, people who have known us, they've bought from us, we want to retarget them again, they're, you know, clicking on our ads, we're ready to target them with what we call a custom audience in Facebook. Um, they're a little bit more sophisticated. And the custom audiences are what we build our, our uh, lookalike audiences from. So we're, when we get there, we'll build our, our saved audiences, the colds, then we'll build our, our hot audiences, the customs, and then we'll build our, our warm audiences, the lookalikes. So just something to think about if you're at that stage. And because as we know, target audiences can be one of our most important assets. If you are spending any money on any kind of promotional items, print collateral, traditional advertising, or wanting to allocate $200, $2,000 a month and get in the game on some strategic digital advertising, um, you know, this is where it can really make a difference to set these audiences up right. Before you would ever spend a dime on this stuff, as I said earlier, you want to build proper audiences. And then likewise, before we start creating any more content, we want to know who we're talking to. So we'll get there. We'll go into Facebook Audience Manager um, and Facebook Business Suite. It lives within Business Suite on March 10th. That's workshop number nine, but you're welcome to start playing around with those now if you like. There's no shortage of tutorials out there. Facebook does try to make it pretty easy, um, but your job currently is just to think about those categories and who might fall into them and then try and map them out in your workbook if you can a little bit. And I will say, uh, lastly, that behind every successful piece of content is a spectacularly receptive audience. Nothing performs well as a blog post, an Instagram reel, a TV ad, if the audience isn't receptive to it and it wasn't targeted to the right people for the right reasons. That's when we love things. It's when we relate, we understand, we love it, we share it. You know, we are the receptive audience that was built on purpose. Um, any more questions or things that we could talk about with uh, audience identification? Oh, for sure. Absolutely. So um, we have an attendee and they say, so is the point that you have different messages for different custom for, for customers at different stages of the funnel? Like, do we have those different messages or is it all one message and we're just targeting them at different times? Yeah. You know what? If there was part two of this workshop or if it was two hours, that is the very next thing we'd go into is a deeper um, touch on the customer journey. So the first step, which is what we're covering today, is who are they? Who is your big, broad audience that you could probably talk to no matter what stage they're at in their journey? But who are they? We really need to know that and then build a couple of other audiences. Sometimes when I look at this guy here, I like to think this is my current customer. And for those of you that aren't ready to think about customer journey or cold, warm, hot, so buyer stage, 
I want you to think about current customer and then maybe you print a second page of this and you think about future customer. So that's audience member number two. Or is there like, if you want to think about it as like current and then next that I'd evolve into and then dream customer. Maybe they're online. Maybe they live in Europe. Maybe they're males and you've only ever targeted females or been able to reach them effectively. So, and that right away now, we're starting to see some of that customer journey stuff come to life. Current, next, future or dream customer, you know, getting them to mm -hmm. really, um, to buy. So this is where you have to make some decisions about, you know, is it most important for me to craft content for an audience that is defined based on audience member A, B, and C? Or is it more important for me to, because I feel like I know my current audience well, to think about how to get um, my next audiences lined up and my, my hot converting audience, if you will. Yeah. And, and I think, I mean, this is back to something that you said earlier about being cautious about too many personas and too many, or, you know, like too many separate audiences or targets. The thing that I observe quite often in working with businesses is that they, they're scared about targeting just one group of people, totally. you know, because yeah. that market's not going to be big enough for me. And that's concern. And I mean, the advice that I give and see people be successful with is start with that group and nail it. Maybe in your yeah. small town, you will have to have some secondary markets, but until you have really nailed that first group, you're not going to be successful with B, C, and D. You like, right. yeah. yeah, like know that group very, very well before we, we move yeah. on. That's definitely something. The other thing, and this is, oh, sorry, Kelly. Did no, I was going to say, I couldn't agree more. And if that's all you did, was really know that one audience and speak to them effectively. It's like the um, the anecdote I gave last or two weeks ago with Battistella condos, where they name their buildings really sexy names and they're attracting, trying to be, attract the micro condo buyer that's the millennial. And it was overseas investors and and baby boomer parents that started buying. And we said, don't you dare change the messaging. Because they're like, we got to start marketing to baby boomers who are buying these things for their kids. It's not the, the 20 year olds that are buying it. We're like, no, no. The moment you do that and you're no longer talking to these millennials with the micro condo, eco-conscious, you know, sustainable living angle, then you're going to lose them and their parents won't buy it for them. So knowing your audience well, and that's the attracting other people as a result. It, it works. It really does. Yeah, um, we've got a, an extra comment here. Why is it that our customer our avatar can never be us? Meaning, why can't I be my ideal customer? I designed clothing and started off designing clothing for my ideal customer. I did a ton of research into who this girl was and felt like I was speaking to her through my content, but my sales were not where they are now. Now I am designing clothing that I would wear and I'm doing much better. Well, that's that. good to hear, but yeah. I'm sure Kelly's got something to say. No, I mean, I, um, I've never actually been explicitly told that our customer avatar can't be us. You might not, but I agree. I did the same thing. I literally about five years ago, when we started creating a more robust suite of online courses, I sat down and thought about myself as a small business owner with a one-year-old child and a lot of bills to pay about nine years prior. And I was like, this is, I would be this customer. And again, as I said earlier, I knew her well, I could speak exactly to that starving entrepreneur in her basement with the baby that was trying to become an entrepreneur and needed marketing tools. So absolutely, whoever that is, um, flesh it out and, and whoever you can speak to most effectively going forward, even if it's you in the mirror, future you, past you, current you, go for it. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. That's no, I don't, the only place I would maybe advise caution is that because you, be, I think that we can be our ideal customer. I'm going to kind of get, use an anecdote here. Like craft breweries, the people who open and start craft breweries, they are obsessed by craft beer. They love it. They like challenging ones. They like ones with interesting flavors and tastes and things. The best selling beer in, in Canada is probably still Bud Light. So we have to be conscious that our biases, because we are so passionate about that pro product, are reflected by a large enough audience to be yeah. um, to be totally to be profitable. I mean, that would be yeah, just the the one thing that yeah. I would caution. Uh, I am D um, and and Lise said uh, here that uh, sadly she's dealing with grief and she went into a ton of Facebook groups, added content, um, and she grew an audience 
through that approach as well. Um, and that's definitely, we've looked at lots of things where which are going to cost you money, but there is a way to do it through, um, I think Gary Vaynerchuk calls it the two cents approach, where it's just going in and giving your two cents on lots and lots of, and lots and lots of content. It's very, very time consuming, but it's, but it is free to do. Um, and so, yeah, there's definitely ways to find your people there. I agree. And you know what, that's such a, that's a really nice tee up for actually, I don't want to put that Lisa's comment off, but in, in a couple of weeks, when we talk about uh, story and content is the workshop on December 13th, did we say 16th? Um, that will be a really great time for us to talk about some of those tactics, you know, and yes, we're talking about knowing our people this week, but the next evolution of that again, is like the content that we want to create to connect with those people next and finding them too. So forum discussions like that, we'll look at things like LinkedIn groups or Facebook groups, um, the private channels that people are turning to, or the, let's just say less public channels and where we can really find our people. Um, you know, you look at something like, um, oh, just certain companies that'll have a Facebook page with a million fans and yet their Facebook group will have 2 million people in it because they just want to connect with like-minded Yeti cooler users or that hot pot, Thing. I forget what it's called all the time. It's that famous stock pot. You guys all Instapot. know. Instapot. Instapot. That's it. Yeah. The Instapot fan group and the, the, you know, and Instapot facilitates it, but talk about a forum of like-minded people keeping Instapot top of mind and buying all the new products as a result. Um, so we want to find our people. And if you can facilitate those conversations, step in, add your two cents, as Matt said, um, and position yourself as an expert, but also a friend or a resource or just another voice that's there, that's what social media does best. And, and I observe quite often the, the issue, and someone's mentioned a podcast here, of people jumping straight to those nurture tactics or the, you know, before we've actually built the, uh, we've built any awareness. And I know they kind of have to be done hand in hand, but quite often I'll see someone put, you know, tremendous amount of efforts into writing 2000 word blog posts and creating video, you know, content on YouTube that no one is actually seeing um, because we're doing nothing to get them there. You know, like we've not yeah. built, we're not building any awareness that we're doing yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that goes back to, um, you know, you're kind of always farming or fishing. If you're not adding new leads in and reaching new audiences, I mean, unless you have a killer customer base that's always going to come back for more and you only need 10 clients because you're a service-based business, you know, um, writing tax returns for people, whatever it is. Uh, you know, most of us find ourselves in a position where we have churn, we have turnover, we don't have 100% customer retention, or we're in businesses that don't have any retention, because we're a retail shop. And we're, you know, we don't often see repeat customers. So sure, well, repeat customers and keeping people cycling through the customer journey is ideal at the end of the funnel action. Action. Take action again. That's not realistic. We need to be finding new audiences and new markets. So that's a, pro a process of listening and then speaking to them. And even if you're really good at speaking to those on your e-newsletter list that are constantly coming back for more, you would be remiss in not trying to reach new cold leads as well. And so whether that means you want to have, again, a different avatar for that person and you know their needs, or you just want to think about it down the road. Okay, well now how do I stretch into a new market? How do I find new buyers or customers because I've tapped out this one? Um, and sometimes that's an extension of your products. And sometimes it's an extension of your messaging. I need to add new products to now serve this same group, but tell them about my new products as a cold kind of offering, or I need to find new markets, new people, new age demographics, regions, et cetera. And if you know you're selling really well in Saskatchewan, brilliant. We're going to create some lookalike audiences and lookalike content and serve it up to just the right people in Winnipeg. And that are Manitoba. And that's where Facebook audience manager and ads, and of course they own Instagram. So Instagram as well. That's where it's so powerful because they can say, Hey, we've got an audience for you. They look exactly like the same type of audience that you, this is really resonating with in Saskatchewan. We're going to help you target them over here in Manitoba with a similar cross section of interests and behaviors and likes and needs. 
so powerful it's just so powerful uh, and a great place to kind of uh, to stop for today just because we're kind of at time but it had been a real pleasure i've enjoyed the conversation uh, with kelly and definitely the conversation and questions that we've had into the chat um i've definitely not answered them all but we've answered as many as we can in the time that we have um thanks for trailing uh, the next event which is on december the 16th we'll be all feeling pretty festive by that point hopefully definitely. Uh, <laughs> and it's on story and content so it'd be great to have you here remember that dep.businesslink.ca is the place to go to learn more about the digital economy program and uh, hopefully see you all on the 16th thanks kelly awesome thanks you guys see you bye soon now. bye